Spider-Man does whatever a spider can. Spins a web any size, catches thieves just like flies. Look out, here comes the Spider-Man. Hi everybody, my name is Bruce Wechtenheiser, and I've been a mega Spider-Man fan for over 50 years. I've collected all the comic books, tons of memorabilia, and I made some deep emotional connections over those years. And finally, it took me 50 years to be discovered, two years ago, our fearless leader of the Spider-Man crawl space, Brad Douglas, interviewed me remotely here in my home, and we talked about the stories of how I got so connected to the character of Spider-Man. We looked at all my memorabilia, and from there, things kind of just snowballed. Uh, I've been featured in so many different media, I'm doing presentations at comic book conventions now, and I'm writing articles and doing videos like the one you're about to watch here. And we call them Spidey Stash. This is episode six, and behind me, you can see that I've got just a few posters hanging up in my Spidey room here at my house. And this episode is all about Spider-Man posters. How many do you have? How many will you remember from the video you're about to watch? Let's go. So let's talk about Spider-Man posters, everybody. While you're watching this video, you're gonna have more content here than just reading the article. So buckle your seat belts. Here we go. Spidey posters, Spidey Stash, episode six. And as you can see, I like Spider-Man posters. In fact, they're the only things pretty much that stay up on my walls in my Spidey room all the time. Most of my other memorabilia that you see on the table there gets put away into boxes and bins. I don't have the space to display it here in my house, so the posters stay up. I love posters. Hopefully you do as much as I do. In this video, we're not going to cover every single Spider-Man poster ever made, but we'll cover a good bit of them, especially the key ones. I like to call them the key ones. As you can see, sometimes I take some of my posters down, move them around, but I love posters and I love talking about Spider-Man memorabilia here on Spidey Stash. So let's go back to the granddaddy of them all. 1965, Marvel Comics was having a mystery of some item that's coming for sale in a mysterious mailing tube. And if you watched uh, my first episode, or actually my second episode, which was Mail Away Items, you would have heard a lot about the 1965 Steve Ditko Spider-Man poster. Yes, for $1.99, you could have gotten this giant six-foot poster in glorious color designed by the Spider-Man co-creator, Steve Ditko. And as a child, I came into the comic books a little bit too late, missed out on the poster, but back in 2020 on eBay, I found one that was a little bit damaged, and that's the only way I could afford it uh, at this point uh, to buy one of these. It's, it gets pretty expensive, but they're in nice shape. So a friend of mine made the frame that you see there in the photo. And eventually I had a costume designed to make it look like I walked right off the poster. And I think the person who designed the costume for me did a really good job of that. And I was so glad to finally get that Ditko poster, especially since I live here in Johnstown, Pennsylvania, which is Steve Ditko's hometown. I've lived here my whole life. And that getting that poster, it just elevated my collection to another level. It really did, and I'm so glad that I finally have that poster. So one of the most iconic posters of Spider-Man was probably the first one offered by Marvel Comics way back at the beginning uh, of Spider-Man's existence almost, 1965. And a friend of mine uh, that I met through the collecting world, his name is Dennis Condon. He also has a Spider-Man poster from 1965, the six-foot version, and he takes it to different conventions and places where he meets comic book professionals. And he just asks them to sign it. Sometimes they'll doodle on it. Sometimes they'll make drawings or make other comments. But almost all the front and back is covered. And he has a page on Facebook. You don't have to join a group. But just check out his page of all the encounters he's had with the uh, different professionals. And them signing it and the stories behind that. Spider-Man Poster Adventures on Facebook. It's a really cool page. It's a really cool uh, resource. And it's a great history lesson to see all the... Uh, professionals signing that poster and you can see he brought it to Johnstown last summer we had a two-month-long Steve Ditko exhibit to honor Steve here in his hometown 
And my poster there is on the left in the frame. His poster, he's holding it. He's actually behind it. You can't see his fingers or his feet. And I'm in the middle in my Steve Ditko costume. So not sure how many times you're going to see two of those in the same room at the same time. That's a very rare poster. And here is Steve Ditko's nephew, Mark Ditko. Uh, that poster at the exhibit was kind of like a, a centerpiece for people to gather and take photos. So I had a chance to take a photo with my friend Mark that day and other people from my family. Uh, my brother is in the left photo, my son is in the middle photo, and there I am again with the Spidey poster in the end there. Then about a year later, a mysterious company, uh, just known as the Marvel Superheroes Club, started offering these eight posters. And you could see in the picture there that the Steve Ditko Spider-Man poster was, was one of them. Uh, they were gonna be very small size, and they weren't gonna be six foot. And they were offered in a couple of different magazines back then and on comic books. But when it actually was all said and done, it really wasn't the same Steve Ditko pose. And I mentioned this in my, one of my previous episodes as well, but uh, some people get confused and they see it on eBay and they think they're getting a Steve Ditko poster when in actuality, you can see the Steve Ditko on the right and the one that was offered from the Superhero Club, the smaller version on the left. And there's a lot of differences in those two. The pose is very similar, but you can see uh, that the belief is that Marie Severin did most of those posters. So that's the belief that she was the artist. She did a wonderful job, but it just wasn't uh, identical to the Ditko. In fact, you could see that in her detailing, you could see the lips and nose of Spider-Man, which you don't really ever see uh, through his mask. So I uh, just want to clear up a little bit of confusion about that. And this poster set was available in a plastic bag with a cardboard header on it. And all the posters were inside. Uh, on one side was the Hulk and flipped it over, Captain America. And at one point I did own a sealed set and I sold it off a couple years back. In 1969, Marvel Mania, the fan club that Marvel allowed an outside company to run, offered these beautiful four uh, full color posters. And of course the Spider-Man was beautiful, there's mine uh, from my room here. And Ramita did the artwork, John Ramita, and it was a beautiful poster. But actually, Jack Kirby was signed on to do the poster originally. And this is his version of it. Uh, it's very rare to find one of these available, but they actually produced some of these at the beginning. But um, as great as Jack was, he just never could get Spider-Man quite right uh, as far as his drawing. I love Jack Kirby, but I don't know what the reason was, but he just couldn't quite get Spidey right. He put the Sentinels in this poster, and they weren't really even Spidey villains. So that's a rare one. There's Jack looking at it uh, in his in his office there. And if you can find one of those, very rare. Grab it. In 1971, as you can see, we're going chronologically here. There was a cool company called the Third Eye, and they created all these trippy black light uh, products. The, these posters they created. They created some puzzles that you can get in a box and put them together, and also some trading cards with featuring some of the same art. Very trippy, very cool, very sought after by collectors. And they've even reproduced some of them. Last year, there was a book that came out. It wasn't really a book, it was a portfolio, but Roy Thomas did the foreword in that book. And uh, the posters were created in a smaller size so that you wouldn't mistake them for an original. And the colors weren't exactly the same because they weren't created in the same type of uh, process. But there's the Spider-Man poster by itself. And then there was a second Spider-Man poster where he kind of teamed up with Submariner for an underwater scene. And some of these poses on the posters were kind of like an odd selection, but that makes them even cooler because they were so odd and they were so trippy with the black light material. Third eyes, those are hard to come by, very expensive if you get the originals. They're coming out with the second volume of the reproduced posters. That'll be coming out soon. So I think they're going to cover pretty much all the posters that were ever produced. So you could buy them in a more affordable format, but a little bit smaller than the originals. In 1972, one of my favorite items came out. That was my first episode of Spidey Stash, the rock comic, Spider-Man Beyond the Grave, cool record album. And inside there was actually a full-size poster that was folded. So when you brought it out of, of the LP cover, it was a folded poster and you could put it on your wall. And that's what I did. It was on my bedroom wall for years, people. I was, if it made it onto my wall, that was kind of like the Hall of Fame of posters. On the left there, you see in 2017, Alex Ross did a tribute to 
to this artwork and he, he put it into uh, a limited print and it was available at two of the major uh, conventions, the San Diego and the New York Convention. And I, I just have them there in my house side by side to show you the comparison of those posters. In 1973, this cool poster with someone in a Spider-Man costume superimposed over the landscape of the city of London. And it was offered through the UK in the Spider-Man Comics Weekly. It was a, a comic series over there. It was a mail-away offer. And then when I ordered my Marvel Value Stamp book, uh, Series 1 book, Marvel Comics also included this poster folded with your Marvel Value Stamp book. So it's, it's a hard-to-come-by poster. It wasn't, you know, easily available, but it was available out there in the mass market. And yes, when people got those stamp books, they promptly ruined the value of many of their comics by cutting the Marvel Value stamp out of the letters page. And when I told Brad Douglas that I did that, he cried himself to sleep that night knowing that I ruined my comics. Uh, speaking of uh, sendaways and things like that, th this video and the article is focusing only on uh, posters that are commercially available. I, I love all the display uh, posters and, and display materials from stores and things that you can't really buy. I love to get them in my collection. And maybe someday I'll do a whole show about display items, but this, this show is all about commercially available. In 1973, this beautiful poster was available in England. Uh, it made its way to the United States. It was available uh, through the superhero merchandise catalogs in, catalogs in the 1970s. And there you see Spidey kicking Sandman right in the jaw. And that was the brand new costume that Sandman had for a while there with a mask and all the green bodysuit and so forth. But cool. In 1974, the Marvel fan club called Foom, which they had uh, pretty much complete control over, produced a series of comic book cover posters. And they were produced in only like three colors. So that was like a red, blue, and black on the Spider-Man. And that was issue number 68, Crisis on the Campus. So they have a whole series of Foom posters that are still kind of available, but they're getting more pricey these days. 1974 also, this beautiful poster and this pose that John by, done by John Romita was used um, multiple times on t-shirts and different things back then, but beautiful white background, John Romita 1974 Spider-Man poster. And then in 1975, I went to Spencer's Gifts, yes, that wonderful store in the mall in 1975, and I bought this beautiful black light Spider-Man running John Romita pose. Uh, everybody took their hand at the Steve Ditko running pose, and Romita's running pose was really commercialized and put on a lot of merchandise. They had a Captain America poster at the same time. These things are so beautiful, and you can feel the velvet uh, on the, the black parts, and I'm glad that I still have mine. This one was one of three posters that I put on my bedroom wall. The first one was a rock comic. This was the second one. Stay tuned to this episode to find out the third and final poster that made it to my Hall of Fame. My wall of fame. In 1975, Spider-Man vitamins were the rage. Uh, you know, most of you probably had to, if you're old as I am, you probably had the Flintstone vitamins, but Spider-Man vitamins came out and this was a a mail away offer from Hudson Vitamins, a cool Remuda pose again. In 1977, a company called The Thought Factory put out a series of character posters, Marvel and DC, and you can see the Spider Man version. It was kind of a cool, you know, artistic style. And down at the bottom is a panel that one of our Crawl Space members will probably love. That panel across the bottom of the screen is a fight between Spider Man and the famous, popular villain. Stegron. In 1979, uh, if you ordered books through your school, you know, the book clubs in school, and if you ordered uh, enough books one, one month, this was given out for your purchases. So everyone in the class could get these if they bought enough books back then. Paperbacks Book Club. In 1981, it was cool to find these available in some comic shops and places around uh, the country. These were the Marvel superhero portfolios. Each one of them had four different kind of like painted, you know, posters inside. And they had different characters. X-Men had one, Hulk had one, and some other characters. But here's the Spidey set. 
and all four of them were really beautifully done. And there's the Green Goblin. J. Jonah D Jameson uh, webbed upside down in his office as Spider-Man swinging away. Doc Ock in big battle scene there. And fourth and final one was the Lizard. And these were kind of cool to find back then because there wasn't a whole bunch of merchandise being produced, you know, that you could hang on your walls back then. So when I found that portfolio, I think I bought two. Kept one sealed, of course. And then here's my third poster for my wall of fame. 1984, Ron Friends, a good friend of the Spider-Man crawl space. We have him on here as much as we can. Terrific artist, kind of close to where I am. He's in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, boy. And I'm only about an hour and a half from there. But he did this wonderful poster. Look at all those characters from the old days to the new. And this was when Ron was on his uh, fantastic run of Amazing Spider-Man comic books. And that poster was proudly displayed on my bedroom wall for many years. So that was number three of three for my bedroom wall. This poster was also produced in 1984 when the Hobgoblin was just introduced on the scene. And... Uh, this was a cool poster with, with action and the goblin bombs flying in the air. Around 1988, several different posters, I didn't include all the, the photos of them, but uh, came out that looked kind of like this one that you see here uh, on the screen. Uh, different Romita kind of like stock images from Marvel were put onto posters and still very colorful and very cool. So they were, they were you know, a good addition to, to your wall if you had a chance to buy those back in the late 80s. This beautiful poster by Joe Jusco, painted again. Uh, I just, I fell in love with it when I saw it. You know, I bought it. I think I still have it. I never put it up on the wall. But uh, Spider-Man, you know, changing, uh, Peter Parker changing it to Spider-Man with, the, with the, the mask hanging off the side of his jeans there and everything. But very beautiful, very hard to find in nice condition, but it's a cool, a very cool poster. 1990, John Romita Sr., put down some uh, classic villains and some modern villains on this poster. And it's it's just a wonderful display, again, of John Romita's talents. 1992, Ken Stacy uh, got popular with his somewhat you know painted style there. And here's a happy anniversary poster for Spidey and MJ. I think Spidey's glass is empty because he's hanging upside down. But that one's uh, somewhat hard to come by, it too. You don't see it pop up too often for sale. Then in 1995, I was pleased to get one of the limited uh, signed editions of this print by Alex Ross and John Romita. And it was, you know, a tribute to the old Spectacular Spider-Man magazine, number two from 1968, the battle between the Green Goblin and Spider-Man high atop the city of New York. And of course, that cover was kind of recreated in 1973 for Amazing Spider-Man annual number nine where they kind of did a reprint of that story in a modified form. But beautiful artwork. And if you can get the limited edition print with both of them signing it in pencil, it doesn't get any better than that. In 1997, a company tried to get back into the blacklight market, and that was their Spider-Man version. I think they had maybe a couple other characters, maybe Wolverine. But I remember you know, seeing them in the stores, comic shops back in 1997, and I got the Spider-Man. In 2000, a beautiful print was produced, uh, Spider-Man in the Rain, by John Romita Jr. and John Romita Sr. They teamed up on this one, and they had some very limited editions of these. Some of them were sold framed only, but a really cool image and a classic, uh, iconic Spider-Man poster to own. In 2004, Ross and Romita teamed up again, and look at this poster. This is incredible. All the characters, or at least a lot of them, that John Romita worked on on the Spider-Man books, and maybe some other books, but just incredible. It shows you the, the depth of John Romita's career and, and how many characters you know he, he portrayed in the comics. Incredible. And then finally, in 2008, uh, this poster hangs proudly in one of the Crawl Space contributors, JR's Green Goblin Room. He's a big fan of the Green Goblin, and this is Alex Ross. And every time you see JR on the crawl space, you can probably see this poster behind him. But uh, again, Alex Ross, you know, capturing a realistic version of what superheroes or supervillains would look like in the real world. If, if, uh, if they are standing in the room with you and, 
I wouldn't want this guy standing in the room with me. But anyway, everybody, um, as you can see, I love posters. I love talking about Spider-Man memorabilia. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode of Spidey Stash, all about the Spidey posters. If you know of other Spidey posters that you consider iconic or deserving of uh, honor and tribute, then please comment in the section below on this website and let us know. Maybe we'll, we'll get a couple more posters in an episode soon to come. Uh, I just wanted to point out that I now have a website. The last time I did it at Spidey Stash, I did not have a website. So I've created a website called SpideyandMe.com, and I've been taking my, sh my stories that uh, I've shared with Brad on the YouTube videos uh, for the Spider-Man Crawl Space, taking them on the road, taking them live uh, to audiences at comic book conventions. And I've been applying all over the place, hoping to get in, and I've done about six shows. I have about five more on my schedule, but my schedule is on my website, and some of them some of my memorabilia and other things are also on that website. So if you know of any conventions in your area and you'd like to try to get me there to tell my stories and share my passion and my love of Spider-Man uh, to a live crowd with PowerPoint and bring some of my memorabilia along with me to, to show it in person, please let me know. I do pres two presentations. One is about my life and my 50 years of connecting and collecting. And the other one is about my connection with Steve Ditko, that we're both from Johnstown and, of course, my love for Spider-Man. Uh, I talk about that and my connection with Steve Ditko, the co-creator of Spider-Man, being from the same town as me. But I hope everyone enjoyed this episode. Uh, I'm having a great time. Like I say, living my blessed Spidey life. And I hope that you're all having a great time out there as well, uh, collecting, enjoying Spider-Man, and going along for the ride. God bless everybody.